Okay, so today we're uh, reviewing for your test over sections 9.1 through 9.4. All right, the first concept that you need to remember from uh, for this test is finding the square root of a number. Okay, and specifically your directions will say find the square roots of the number. Um, and that means because for every whole number, what, uh, what are its square roots? What's it going to be? Just tell me. It's going to be positive and negative, and in this case, when you take the square root, it's 25. Positive, negative, 25. On number two, here's your directions. It says find the square root or to evaluate it, but now you are approximating the answer to the nearest integer. So it will say approximate the square root to the nearest integer. The directions will be very specific on how you write your answer. There are multiple ways that you can write your answer, but the directions tell you which way is your full credit answer. All right, so we did struggle somewhat with some of that. So you guys saw a lot of partial credit on your quizzes because um, maybe you just wrote your answer not the way the directions asked you to write it. All right, so 160, is 160 a perfect square? It is not a perfect square. However, it might not be simplified because there might be a factor of 160 that is a perfect square. Is there a perfect square factor? Okay, there is a perfect square. Wait, yeah, 16 times 10. However, in this case, that's not what I'm doing, okay? I'm actually rounding to the nearest integer, so I need you to know the difference. So with your perfect square factors, that's when you're simplifying. In this section, it will say just round it to the nearest integer. So the square root of 160, it's about 12.6, so hit the S to D button. It'll tell you the four times the square root of, what did you say, 10 in your calculator? But now hit the S to D button and round it to the nearest integer, okay? So the answer yes is four times the square root of 10, okay? But when it says, round or approximate it to the nearest integer, that's when you do 13, okay? So in a couple questions, I think it's like number five or four, um, we're going to do it the other way. So if it says integer, give me the decimal. If it says simplest form, you're going to leave it under the radical, all right? Hopefully that'll make more sense in a minute. On uh, number three, we're going to solve the equation, okay? And again, the directions will specifically tell you how to write your answer. Just like on number two, it said approximate to the integer, so that's what we did. <coughs> on number three, we're rounding to the tenth if needed. It might be a whole number, might not, or it might already be to the tenth place. I don't have to round, but if I do, I round to the nearest tenth. All right, so on the quiz, I saw a lot of people taking the square root first. What did they forget to do? You have to divide by three. You take the square root last. Okay, so you have to get rid of everything else connected to the variable, then take the square root, and in this case, it works out very nicely. Uh, what is your answer? Seven. No. Seven. Negative seven. Positive negative seven. Positive negative seven. Don't forget the positive negative. You will lose two points on each answer if you forget the sign. So your answer is both positive and negative. Can anybody tell me why? What's negative 7 times negative 7? 49. Positive 49 times 3 is still 147. It still checks out, okay? So that's why my answer is both. There's also not a radical in the original problem, all right? My answer is positive and negative. All right, now going back to what we just talked about in example 2, I need you guys to understand this difference. On number 2... It said, approximate the square root to the nearest integer. That's why I rounded it to the nearest whole number. Now, this one is going to say, simplify the expression. That's it. Now, I'm dealing with perfect square factors, okay? And I leave my answer under the radical if there's a number left over, all right? Do you see the difference? Rounding to the integer, approximate, yes. I change it over to the decimal. Simplest form, I leave my leftovers under the radical. All right, let's simplify this. I need to see your perfect square factors, too. Now, since it says simplify or simplest form, I'm going to find the perfect square factors. All right, 162 is not a perfect square, 
but 81 is a factor of 162 and is a perfect square. So I take the square root of that number. Who got 9 times the square root of 2? Raise your hand if you got 9 times the square root of 2. I think you have 3 of these um, on your test tomorrow. All right, number 5. Find the square root of 50a squared b. The square root of 50a squared b. This is similar, I think, to number nine, 8. Number eight on your quiz from yesterday. This one's similar. Okay, how can I split up 50? How can I split up 50? Can I do five times 10? Would that be helpful? No, because neither one of those numbers are perfect squares. Does 50 have a perfect square factor? 25. So 25 times two. Now, here's my suggestion for the variables. You don't have to do this, but I think it's helpful if you split them up. Because maybe one variable, you could take the square root, but the other variable, you couldn't, okay? So we split it up this way. Now, which ones of these numbers, okay, between 20 square root of 25, 2, A squared, and B, which ones can we take the square root? Yeah, so we could take the square root of 25 to be 5. Then what? A. Can I take the square root of 2 or B? So those get left under the radical. 5A to the, times the square root of 2B. Who got that right? 5A times the square root of 2B. Do you understand why I could not pull out the B? Do you get that? Because there was only one. I have to have pairs of 2 in order to take the square root of it. Okay? Number 6. Now find the square root of x over 200y squared. Now, I'm having a little bit of a struggle today with students not realizing that the fraction cannot just uh, go away, okay? So in order for the fraction to not be in my answer, the denominator would have to cancel, and it's not going to. There's nothing in this problem that would make it cancel. So it's okay for a fraction to be in our answer. Right, but I did give you some hints the other day when we, we were reviewing this. What do I do when I'm taking the square root of a fraction? How can I break it down? Okay, so go ahead and do that. Okay, so we, need, we do need to split it. Square root of x over square root of 100 times square root of 2 times y squared. All right, now I can take the square root of 100 and y and the 2 stays underneath. One thing I need you to know is the square root of x has to stay the square root of x because I can't take the square root of x. It's only 1x. All right, so you keep it under the radical in your answer. I have a lot of people not realizing that and just trying to say x in their answer, but you couldn't take the square root of x, so you have to leave it under the radical. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, number seven. Test to see whether these side lengths form a right triangle. You do have two questions like this on your test, okay? If these side lengths form a right triangle, all right, test. Okay, 5 squared plus 13 squared equals 15 squared. You're testing it in the Pythagorean theorem. Did everybody get that? Okay, so what is 5 squared plus 13 squared? What is it, guys? Why 94, does that equal 225? No. So you say no. Who got that right? You got that right. Okay, two questions like that on your test. The next question says, find the unknown side length, and this is the important part, and this is the part where we struggled on the quiz. Read the directions. If the directions say approximate to the tenth or to the integer, then change it over to a decimal. If it says simplest form, like your homework did, if it says simplest form, you will leave your answer under the radical. 7 squared plus 8 squared equals c squared. 113 equals c squared. So when you take the square root of 113, what does it give you? The square root of 113. It cannot be simplified any further than that. Now, you can write it as a decimal, but the direction said to simplify it. Simplest form means leave it under the radical. All right? Are you starting to see the difference? 
It'll say simplest form. That means under the radical. If it says approximate to the tenth, then you know to approximate to the tenth. Okay? All right, next question. Is this number rational or irrational? Make sure you give me the value and classify it. So you can't just say rational or irrational. Okay, so I cannot determine if it's rational or irrational as a fraction. I have to convert it to a decimal. Sometimes it'll be a whole number, sometimes a decimal. I'm not going to know until I convert it. Here it's going to be 1.5. What point five is what kind of number? It is a terminating decimal, which means it is rational, terminating rational. I need the entire description. All right, number 10. You're going to put these numbers in order, least to greatest. Square root of 30, negative 3.5, 17 over 5, negative square root of 12. Okay, so let's go ahead and put these in order, least to greatest. What's the square root of 30? 5.4547 or something like that. Okay, 5.4, negative 3.5. What's 17 over 5? 3.4. What's negative square root of? Negative 3.4. So if you forget that negative, you might think it's the same number, but it's not. It's negative. So they're like opposite ends, right? Okay, we don't have to use a number line, but we do need to put these back in order, least to greatest. So based on their decimal values, which one is the smallest number? Negative 3.5. Then I'm going to write very, wait, no. Negative, not 12, but negative square root of 12, back in the original format. In the original format, okay? What's, what's the next number? And then the last number? Square root of 30. Square root of 30. All right, who got that right? Least to greatest? Okay, number 11. This is one question on your test. It is a review question. Write this equation in slope-intercept form. Write the equation in slope-intercept form. All right, what do I do first? Subtract 18x because I need to solve for y. So subtract 18x to the other side. And now I get 3y equals which term comes first? Which term come first? Negative 18x plus 24. Now what do I do? Divide everything by 3. Okay, who got that right? Negative 6x plus 8. Good. Okay, so that's one question on your test, and it's worth 5 points. It's worth the same amount of points as the other questions. Now I have another question for you. Okay. Um, if I were to give you a question on your test and I said, write the Pythagorean theorem, I don't mean spell it out, I mean write the Pythagorean theorem. What is the Pythagorean theorem? Write it down on your paper. And all it's going to say in your test is, write the Pythagorean theorem. Alright guys, so say it with me. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Very good. All right, I'm going to ask you to write another formula. And we just solved this in number 11, but I want the template, okay? If I asked you what is the formula for slope-intercept form, you would say Y equals MX plus B, okay? So that's going to be a question on your test and something worth writing down to study tonight just to make sure you remember and recognize the way I'm asking you. I'm going to say write the slope-intercept formula. You will say Y equals MX plus B. If I say to write an equation like on number 11 in slope-intercept form, then you know how to rearrange it, okay? I'm also going to ask you a question uh, a couple true-false questions. So if I ask you true or false, um, the opposite of a real number is a fake number. No. You would say true or false. false. Is there any such thing as a fake number? No. no, okay, so it is kind of, you know, we kind of laughed about it when we taught the lesson. Well, any number in the universe is a real number, 
whether it's rational or irrational is a different question. Um, what if I said to you a negative number can sometimes be a whole number? Would that be true or false? Okay, can it ever be a whole number? No, because whole numbers are only positive. So negative numbers will never be whole numbers. Okay, so some, some questions like that, you know, you might see um, on your test tomorrow. Something else that would help you a little extra would be a question like this. Might help you a little extra on your test tomorrow. If I gave you this equation and I said, write the equation of the line that is parallel to the given line and passes through point zero, negative two. You write the equation of the line that would be parallel to this line and pass through point zero, negative two. Okay, what do we know about the slopes of parallel lines? They're the same. They're the same. So if the line's parallel, the slope's going to be exactly the same, except now where's this y-intercept? Negative two. Negative two. Okay. Now, what if I had said perpendicular? What would happen to the slope? You would change the. I would flip it so it would become instead of two over one, now it is one over two. But then you flip the sign also. So if I were to say the perpendicular, you would flip it and do the opposite sign. So. That would just help you a little extra, if you know what I mean, on your test tomorrow if you knew how to do those. Okay, if you understand that, that's everything you need to know for your test tomorrow.